Welcome back to People Analytics. I'm your host, Lindsay Patton. Today, I have with me Amy Charlesworth, who is Head of Human Resources at Impact Theory. Welcome, Amy. Hi, so great to meet you. Glad to have you on the show. So uh, we like to kick things off by asking who you are, what you do, and why you do it. I love this. Okay, great. Um, I'm Amy. I have been in human resources since I was 17 years old. Um, I started my, I cut my teeth, I should say, on being a human resources specialist uh, by joining the U.S. Army. And uh, I served in the military for about 16 years um, in a variety of different uh, positions, mostly centered around uh, human resource generalist uh, type work all over the world. And I do this uh, still to this day because it has just become such a passion of mine to interact, engage with people, help them feel successful and recognized at work. Um, And I just, you know, I I can't get enough of it. That's awesome. So one thing I love about talking with the guests on the show is that everyone has a unique pathway into the world of people. Um, So I'd love to hear about those early days, um, especially being in the military um, as an HR specialist. Yeah. So, I mean, it was definitely, um, I didn't even know what human resources was when I was 17. And when I went into the recruiter's office, they said, you know, you you probably would do well. I had done a bunch of uh, a testing. Uh, they, they have a test called the ASVAB test. And they said, you'd probably do well in some sort of like human resources capacity. And I'm like, I don't know what that is, but, um, you know, they had a... a $10,000 signing bonus at the time. And I was like, let's do it. I'm going for it. Whatever it is, I'll figure it out later. And um, so I, uh, I ended up going to Fort Jackson, South Carolina and going through the human resources specialist program. Uh, and they they really um, they really get you up to speed pretty quick. It was a nine week course specifically focused on um, human resources. And it really just teaches you about like uh, regulations, rules, um, you know, uniform code of military justice, which is uh, also known as UCMJ to a lot of people. Um, you know, different uh, ways of dealing with people and, uh, you know, performance management, et cetera. So it was a very, very good intensive course, especially coming out of um, high school. It was really the first exposure I had to any kind of performance, anything. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, I, I just loved it so much because I'm very by the book anyway. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely a rule follower, if you will. And so <laughs> having this environment where I had like these books and these regulations and these rules, I definitely was um, uh, in my groove to be uh, in a, in a capacity that was so involved with law and and legal aspects of um, ways of working. And so, um, you know, over the the course of the next few years, I I went everywhere from Germany to Afghanistan to um, Fort Dix, uh, New Jersey. I mean, just kind of everywhere, working with soldiers and um, onboarding, hiring, um, you know, recruiting. I was a recruiter full time for the military for a few years. So I really kind of touched every single part of of human resources over the course of my career and uh, having the opportunity to do that in such a structured environment like the military um, Mm -hmm. definitely taught me some good skills in terms of, um, you know, dotting my I's and crossing my T's, if you will. Yeah. So all those travels, I imagine, because you are such a people person, was it fascinating for you to learn about cultures and how people live day to day in different countries? Absolutely. That was definitely one of my favorite parts. I mean, I specifically remember when I went to Germany, um, you know, we ended up getting, we had to go through a special driver's course, um, you know, because they have their own uh, set of rules for driving there. And uh, that was very, very interesting because I I had a German instructor and, um, you know, we went out on uh, the German roads and really getting an opportunity to not only like learn some of the language, but, um, you know, interact with the uh, local community and and learn about their ways of working. Like um, a lot of communities there in Germany, you know, take afternoons siestas and um you know they, they take some time away from work um you know to rest and recuperate longer than just like a 30 minute lunch period and so finding those nuances about how people work as well was was pretty interesting and cool yeah and did that support what you do now do you kind of use that information about how people are across the world to inform your current role Absolutely. I think it's really important just in general to stay up to date with what's going on around the world, mm-hmm. uh, but definitely what's going on around, you know, your your particular uh, territory. Things are changing every single day. And so it's really helpful to sign up for different newsletters and um, alerts uh, and things like that. But I, I really love attending conferences that are international or even just, you know, watching uh, YouTube videos or podcasts, et cetera, to see what other countries are doing, because there's some fascinating things. I mean, there's um, some examples around like paternity and 
and maternity leave lengths mm-hmm. and you know uh, different programs that are coming out to support employees during that really precious time in their life. And uh, you know, f- seeing these case studies in other countries can be very telling um, in terms of what's important to um, the, the population and what we may see c- become important to our immediate population so we can prepare, um, but also take those notes you know, from them and, and review those case studies about what was successful, what didn't work, and, and try to um, try to modernize an evolution, uh, you know, and bring evolution to, um, you know, our current uh, offerings as, as far as being an employer um, to, to create the best package and experience for our employees possible. Yeah, that is such an awesome way of looking at it, of kind of like getting inspired by what other cultures are doing that's, you know, I guess right in your ter- in your views and, you know, wanting to implement that where you are in your career. That's really awesome. Yeah, I mean, especially since, you know, we have um, uh, Impact Theory has a global workforce, you know, we have people that are in New Zealand, we have people in Australia, uh, Taiwan, you know, and that's just to name a few. And so, you know, being able to, uh, even though we're a US based company, and, you know, our headquarters is in Los Angeles, it's really amazing, this global reach that we have. And so for us to stay up to date with, you know, th- those happenings, if you will, in the other countries, um, you know, it's, it's really important for us to at least acknowledge what's going on and, and, and see what we can do to try to help everybody feel included at work, uh, regardless of where they're sitting and performing their work. Yeah, so it's interesting to see that there was such a global influence so early on in your career, and it's still in your career today. So has that kind of been the case throughout your career, the middle part of your career as well? I've been so lucky in that regard. I really, really have. I've always had a global position. Um, You know, my first civilian role, um, I switched to National Guard a few years back. Um, so if, if you're not familiar, that's one week in a month, two weeks in the summer versus like full-time active duty. Mm-hmm. And um, when I switched to National Guard, my first civilian role outside of the military was working at Nike. And Nike is obviously a, a global um, workforce. I think at the time they had 78,000 employees, um, you know, and they had 170 something countries that they were in. I mean, so it was very, very uh, expansive. And I was very lucky to work with um, a vice president who uh, for human resources that expanded over all of those territories. And so um, you know, it was very, very interesting to see all of the different personalities, ways of working, cultures, and, you know, there's a little bit of travel involved, which is fun. But, you know, I've had uh, exposure now. I've been at um, Amazon, Red Bull, um, you know, I've worked with Louis Vuitton, um, you know, all global companies. And so very, very lucky in that respect. Um, and now I'm at a much smaller company, you know, with Impact Theory, but still still global presence. And so it, I, I really appreciate the experience that I've been able to gather over the years. Yeah, that's really incredible. And so I want to talk a little bit about being a veteran and making that, you know, that switch into civilian uh, working. Um, you know, one episode I did was with a retired uh, lieutenant colonel who advocates for veterans in the workplace and, um, you know, has, and we spoke about all the qualities, like the amazing qualities uh, that veterans bring. Can you share some of the, the qualities that you think that you bring to the workforce that's unique because of your experience? Yes, I love this topic. I'm actually getting goosebumps. I'm so excited you're talking about it because Um, Man, if there's one thing that I can do, um, you know, by doing things like this and, you know, doing podcasts or any kind of external outreach, I really hope to reach other soldiers to let them know it's possible. Because I'll tell you, one of the biggest um, challenges, hurdles, loops that someone's got to get through um, is that transition period. It is so Mm -hmm. hard. I mean, the, um, the ways of working in the military are so incredibly different. It's like being on another planet. When you leave the military and you go to the civilian workforce, um, it's one hard to find a role that is in line with your experience. I'll give you an example. Um, when you are a human resource professional um, uh, in the military, while there's a lot of similarities, you're dealing with a whole different set of rules, laws, um, you know, ways of working. The uni- UCMJ is separate from your local and federal um, and state laws. And, and so you have to learn a whole new set of skills. And so um, there, there is some direct crossover, like you know, being a truck driver, you're going to be driving trucks, you know, in the civilian side, but um, there, again, there's different ways of working. And so they don't always come over with the right credentials. And, mm-hmm. um, 
And that's one thing I know that there's some uh, great leaders in Senate uh, doing some work on, like Tammy Duckworth. I know she was fighting heavily for getting, you know, the appropriate um, classifications and certifications that people need. And I think there's still a lot of work to be done on that front. But, um, you know, some of the skills that, you know, uh, people come over with inherently is like being on time. Their, uh, mm-hmm. their work ethic is just second to none. I mean, they're yeah. committed, they're driven, they're focused, they're determined. Um, you know, they're able to meet uh, challenging deadlines. They're, they work well under pressure. Um, you know, they come inherently with skills to figure things out. I mean, you know, when you're, um, when you hire someone, there's definitely a learning curve. And I truly believe that when you hire someone who's in the military, that learning curve is much shorter in terms of like, mm-hmm. the line. they're going to figure it out quickly because they have so much experience going into the unknown in all kinds mm-hmm. of training environments, figuring it out, you know, knowing where to look, knowing where to reference. And it's just a much easier transition period. Um, but, you you know, depending on which skill set that they're coming with, whether they were, you know, a truck driver, an infantry soldier, a human resource professional, a marketer, it doesn't matter what they were doing in the military. Um, you know, if you have a service member that is applying for a role with you on the civilian side, it is so behoove of you to interview them um, and chat with them because they're going to be very well put together, um, you know, very, uh, very um, determined to figure things out and do a good job for you. Yeah, that's awesome. So how did you work to overcome kind of the challenges that you faced in that transition? And um, have you had an opportunity to help other veterans kind of, uh, you know, overcome those hurdles as well? Yes. So um, I actually, I was very lucky um, during my search to find a civilian role. Nike had at the time, um, Charles Leverton, who is based in Portland, he was um, the founder of the Nike Military Veterans um, ERG employee resource group. Mm-hmm. And um, so I, I found um, him online and that he was at Nike, an employee there. He founded the um, Nike Military Veterans. And I reached out to him and I just said, hey, I'm a veteran. I'm about to leave um, the service active duty, um, switching to National Guard. Any chance you can help me with interviewing best practices, resume review, which by the way is another huge thing. Veterans have no idea how to put together a resume. Um, and, um, you know, can you help me kind of package myself and give me any pointers of how I can get a role at a place like Nike? And he definitely took me under his wing. He got wow. me connected with a couple of different people that were also volunteers as, um, uh, that were employees, former veterans uh, that worked for Nike. And I ultimately landed a position because of his support. And um, over the years, I joined the Nike Military Veterans Group while I was there. And over the years, I've continued that. I was so lucky to land into an ERG right away, which a lot of companies don't even have these employee resource mm-hmm. groups. Um, but uh, when I did, um, you know, I was able to get the exposure to this is a best in class practice, you know, uh, being able to set up these ERG groups that, you know, there's Black Employee Network, there's the LGBTQ community network, there's all women in, women of Nike, there's all these um, ERG groups. So mm-hmm. to see that kind of structure and the supportive nature of employees helping others other employees, even from just a basic like, hey, look at my resume, what do you think? Mm -hmm. Um, That type of feedback loop and that support is just second to none and helping lift each other up. So to answer your question, I uh, absolutely have turned um, the favor around to several other people and have gotten them linked in and paired with um, a lot of other people uh, to help them elevate their careers. And even to this day, I'll always offer to any veteran, and I'll offer it now, reach out to me if you have a resume, um, uh, you know, and you're, you're leaving the military and you're entering the civilian workforce and you want someone to to look at your resume and help you because that is, you know, I'll just give you a funny example. Um, Working with a lot of infantry soldiers, on their resume, they have things like, I'm an expert with an M4, and uh, I'm a a sharpshooter, I'm an expert marksman, whatever it is, there's all these things related to combat or, you know, war, which which are great if you're deciding to go for a career and like being a contractor somewhere, or, um, you know, security, or maybe becoming a police officer. But if that's not your intent, and you want to go into a field like marketing, or social media, or, you know, podcasting, or whatever, you're going to need to reformat your resume, because that can be off putting to a lot of people, especially in this Mm -hmm. climate, you know, with, um, you know, the mentioning of weapons and things like that, it's really important to tailor those things to make them more digestible to Mm -hmm. uh, the civilian side palette. So things like that, um, you know, I'm able to help kind of structure uh, to help people get uh, their dream role. So I'm always happy to have those conversations with people. 
Oh, well, thank you for putting that out there. That's so kind. And I can tell that you're so passionate about the topic. Um, and it definitely shows because I know that you really love helping people become the best version of themselves. And so I can see, you know, that reflected in how you were treated early on, too, by someone really helping you become the best version of yourself, too. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. So shout out to Charles. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I know one big part of, you know, your career as you've um, developed yourself professionally is that you really, really enjoy developing managers and, you know, have a passion for that. But we all recognize that we don't always have the time (laughs) to develop. Um, So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, You know, what are the challenges that you face with uh, management development? Yeah, this is definitely a, a huge topic of interest for me. Even today, I mean, this is actively an ongoing um, process of discovery and evolution and learning for everybody. Um, you know, especially from the from the human resources lens, when you're dealing with um, excellent employees and they get promoted and they're high performers, and we're putting them into manager positions, um, there's sometimes a mismatch of this person's amazing at what they do. We're going to promote them to become a leader um, because they're so good at what they do. And we don't, uh, not always do we think about the fact that, well, wait a second, one, does this person want to manage other people? And two, do they have the fortitude and the desire to learn how to be a good people manager? Because just assigning two or three people, even one person to somebody, you know, and saying, well, now you're a manager. Well, really a, a leader, you know, is a, is a title that is earned. And um, it, it's something that you have to constantly chase and constantly be developed and working on. So, you know, you got to read books, you need to listen to podcasts, you need to be practicing, you need to be um, getting a mentor to help you navigate difficult conversations and difficult interactions and, you know, development ideas with, um, with your, your uh, employees. I mean, it's an ongoing practice. And I think that's one thing that's uh, often forgotten that when someone's in a position of management, you know, they, they forget to continually learn and develop in those areas. And, and, and again, from the resources side, like we don't always put two and two together in terms of, okay, great. We're promoting this person, but like, you know, have we evaluated in any way, shape or form if they have what it takes to become a people leader? So, um, you know, those two things are, are heavily, uh, neglected sometimes. And so this is my favorite topic right now, um, with my own uh, team where, you know, as, as I'm newer to the organization, one of the first things I've done is um, do just a little, little mini audit of all the teams, mm-hmm. kind of where they're sitting, how they're performing, um, you know, how they're interacting with each other, um, you know, common themes, uh, and just kind of documenting those things just for my own, um, you know, awareness as I'm studying um, my own organization and, you know, um, succession planning and, and, and talent mapping. And one of the things I've noticed is like, we definitely have an opportunity and this, this applies to any organization, not just ours. We definitely have an opportunity to provide um, leadership training and coaching Mm -hmm. and a platform for that. And um, there's so many great resources online and there's so many great companies that do this as a practice full time to um, help develop people leaders. And that's everything from them learning how to, um, uh, hire, right? Like what hiring attributes are you looking for to how they onboard people? Like, um, are they just throwing a laptop at them and saying, all right, welcome to the team? Or are they really sitting side by side and, um, you know, helping them to get to know the platforms, get to know the systems, you know, get to know the expectations, their KPIs, what are the expectations of their performance? You know, um, what does success look like? Right. So those are, those are, that's a a better, uh, experience of onboarding, introducing them to their peers and their, their other team members, their cross-functional stakeholders. So, um, you know, everything from that to, um, you know, checking in, like how often are they having one-on-ones? How often are they, um, um, you know, asking their person, how are you doing today? How are you feeling? You know, how's work going for you? You know, um, where are you at? And and just having that pulse check to uh, make sure that they have, you know, a good grip and a good handle on uh, engaging with them. And so, you know, again, those things are not inherent uh, for most people. And so having that uh, fortitude and that intention to, um, you know, seek becoming a better leader, I think is really, really critical. And, and, and just finding finding resources to provide to your employees is so critical for those things. Yeah. And I know that, um, you know, one thing that you try to do is really tap into why the person is having issues at work. And I know that often that trend is management. 
Yeah. I mean, if you were to Google, what is the number one reason people leave their roles when we talk about retention, the number one reason typically is they they have a, a poor leadership engagement. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, their, their leader isn't someone that they look up to or enjoy working with. And, and that's really, really unfortunate when, when that's the case, because that is definitely a, a solvable issue. Mm-hmm. Um, especially when we talk about how expensive turnover is and, you know, um, attrition is and, you know, uh, Finding new talent, especially in this climate, you know, I think it's it's really essential that um, you know human resource professionals really lean in on people development um, and uh, focusing on developing good people. And so um, that you know that for us as a human resource arm um, is critical for us to focus on our leaders specifically because of course good things trickle downhill. And so if our managers are well supported and well taken care of, they're going to ideally turn around and take really good care of their people as well. And so, um, you know, when I get an employee issue, no matter, no matter what organization I'm with, when I, when I have an employee issue that pops up, um, you know, I'll definitely hear what the manager has to say or what the employee has to say, but I'm always asking for the other person's perspective Mm -hmm. too. So I'm doing Mm -hmm. like a full comprehensive audit, um, you know, and I'll have just very casual conversations with the rest of the team members. Hey, how are you going? How's things going? I won't mention anything about, you know, the situation at hand, but I'll just be checking in, doing a pulse check on the immediate team. Um, and, uh, you know, Know, just listening and you know leveraging those listening skills to kind of figure out where the issue is truly coming from um you know you'll discover um big things in small conversations like um you know i had a conversation with a leader the other day who i discovered was never having one-on-ones with their person and their person was underperforming and not feeling you know really engaged at work and and when i was like well wait a second what about one-on-ones and this goes back to us assuming that someone knows how to be a people leader, they didn't know they needed to have one-on-ones with their person on a regular basis. And that's no harm, no foul to anybody other than they just have never had it demonstrated for them. So, you know, having that um, feedback loop with them to say, hey, listen, have a one-on-one with your person regularly, that will very, very uh, effectively impact the um, deepness of your connection and, you know, the ability for you guys to do good work together. I mean, just that small change really elevated the way the employee was feeling about their manager. Now they're feeling heard. Now they're feeling seen. Now they're feeling engaged with, you know, so their their experience of, you know, uh, being, in, uh, you know, recognized at work shifted in a positive direction. And likewise, the manager reported that, you know, the performance was improving just inherently from having one-on-ones. So um, it's something usually as simple as that small tweak, that small feedback, all big issues. Yeah. So, uh, you know, as being a leader yourself and, um, you know, continually um, pursuing professional development and helping others pursue professional development, what do you see as, you know, some key qualities of a good leader? Yeah. Th- so when I interview um, for definitely for like my manager and, and director level positions, I'm always leaning in with the I, I almost don't care about like their expertise and what they do. Like if they're a marketer, I'm not going to ask you any marketing questions, really. Yeah. I mean, like your resume says enough for me because, um, you know, it, I'm not the expert that needs to review you for your marketing qualities. My yeah. focus from a, a human resources side is are you a good people leader, right? How are you going to um, uh, add to the culture? And so I spend most of my time talking about, you know, tell me about a time, you know, where you've had an underperforming employee. What are your steps to helping them get back to success? And I'm, I'm listening actively, like what they're saying, what methodologies they use. Um, I ask them what kind of leader there are because um, – they, sorry, they are because there's so many different leadership styles. And if they're able to identify a, a correctly a leadership style, like servant leadership as an example, that tells me they've done at least some kind of work around learning about leadership styles because there's very many, there's several of them, um, you know, and uh, they're, you know, they're the one that they most resonate with. Um, I always also enjoy like personality quizzes. Um, there's some really great ones on the market that you can incorporate into your interview process mm-hmm. to kind of just discover, you know, if they're empathetic, if they're a good listener, you know, if they're proactive, if they're energetic. So there's all these different personalities that um, pop up through that process. Um, so it's definitely, a, you know, from a human resources and recruiter side, it's definitely a process of active listening um, and, um, you know, using effective filtering questions. And the, the best qualities I've seen are just, you know, you definitely want someone who's empathetic, but ultimately from a business perspective, you are 
absolutely trying to drive a business forward. Typically, in most scenarios, you're trying to increase revenue, right? You're trying to be effective with um, a budget. You're trying to get top performers and develop people. So all my questions are centered around basically like the coaching skills, like what kind of coach are you? What kind of teacher are you? What kind of leader are you? Um, yes, we want someone who can roll up their sleeves and, and get the work done. Um, you know, using that marketing example, I definitely want someone who knows what they're talking about when it comes to sending emails and, you know, managing a funnel and marketing campaigns, et cetera. But ultimately what I'm really looking for is for a coach. I want someone who's very effective with managing people. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so I know something that you do as a leader is you really look for those low hanging fruit opportunities because the investment pays off. So tell me about some low hanging fruit opportunities that you have done recently. Yeah. So I think we're referring here to, um, you know, just like, uh, ways, ways that we can improve the experience at work for people. Is that right? Yeah. So just little tiny ways that, you know, may cost uh, some money, but in the long run, they're going to get a great return on that, that investment. Yeah. So my, my focus, um, you know, especially having the huge background in recruiting that I have, um, it's always, well, you know, how do I make my job easier in terms of reducing <laughs> the volume of recruiting I have? And that's, of course, retention, right? And retention mm-hmm. is everyone's best friend for the most part. Like some attrition is good. Like you definitely want to, um, you know, uh, it's like, you know, getting new skin cells. Like you definitely want fresh life, you know, into the department once in a while in terms of new ideas and new experience and all of that. So mm-hmm. sometimes good. But for the most time, uh, most of the time, you know, attrition is, is not a good thing in terms of cost and time and energy and lo- loss of product productivity, etc. But, um, you know, as I look at low hanging fruit, you know, what are, where are my wins at for, um, helping keep my, my people happy? Like I really, really care about their experience at work. And, um, there's so many amazing low hanging fruit opportunities. And I'm right now, um, in the process of evaluating a ton myself to, um, add to our current employee benefits offerings. So, of course, benefit 101, you know, like when people come to work, um, base compensation is definitely important. But for a lot of people, it's not the only factor they consider. Yeah. Um, you know, it's also things like having choice based health care, you know, instead of just having like one um, level of health insurance, you know, what options are there? You know, do you have a HSA or a PPO? Like, you know, what, what kind of um, structure do you have set up for your employee benefits? Um, do you have, uh, you know, an employee employer cost share, or is it 100% on the employee? So there's little tweaks like that. And some, um, you know, budget conscious employees, when they're going through the interview process, will ask those things like, well, what, you know, portion of the health insurance are you guys going to contribute? Do you have um, health, you just, sorry, life insurance? Do you have dependent insurance? Do you have daycare? Um, you know, big thing about returning to the office right, right now, which is all the rage. A lot of people are trying to get their people to come back to work after COVID you know, they're being faced with these difficult conversations with their employees who want to come back to work, but they've adopted a dog. They've um, you know, uh, had a baby, you know, they've done all these things over COVID and, and it's changed their uh, ability to be flexible to come into the office. And so having partnerships with local dog daycare centers or even um, like care.com is another one where, um, you know, you're as an employer, you can set up an account with them and sponsor a portion of daycare to help people come back to work. I mean, so there's, um, you know, know, very easily accessible things like that to help them be, you know, engaged, present, uh, you know, and, and happy at work. And then there's other things too, um, you know, that you can do like as a, an employer, you know, you already likely have an account with a program like Apple or, you know, Microsoft. Well, um, you know, on the personal side, that's an easy account for you to set up to give 10% off or 20% off for your employee purchases on the personal side. Mm-hmm. So they get a new cell phone, you know, and have a, a discount or on their phone plans or whatever. So, um, you know, there's things like that. Um, my my absolute favorite one I, I just experienced recently at one of the larger companies I was with was they had a mental health service. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, being able to offer something like that, where it's a employer sponsored subscription service for each of your employees where they can access mental health, um, you know, support anytime they need it. So if they're having a hard day at work, they've got someone to talk to, um, you know, they have like almost like a mentor, um, you know, if they're having something going on at home, there's a resource to provide them with. Um, so I love that as well to help people feel just more engaged and, and again, just successful, well-rounded, um, you know, because your employees are, are at their best in terms of performance when they're taken care of on the personal side, as well as the professional side. So uh, that's, a, that's a low hanging fruit I've been seeking lately. 
Yeah. And I really like how the family support kind of recognizes that not all families are the same, you know, with the, some people may think that they're dogs or, you know, I'm someone who thinks that their dogs are family and, you know, there's people with children that need the support of flexibility um, for that. And to hear that, you know, there's the daycare for, for the dogs and then the flexibility for parents, like that's, that's really awesome. Yeah. And to be honest with you, it's one of my favorites. I mean, I have a, I have a 14 year old uh, son who doesn't need daycare anymore. You know, he's, he's too cool. And, and, uh, you know, <laughs> high school now, but, um, I do have a dog and my, yeah. my dog is, um, four years old and is, um, you know, arguably my, my favorite child. Um, <laughs> I, did, I, you know, I, I, I joke, but, um, uh, you know, my, my, my little baby dog, you know, I, I gotta make sure that when I'm at the office, you know, he's well taken care of. And so yeah. um, you know, there, there, it, that's, that's easy stuff. And I call it low hanging fruit because it has the most impact, but it is so easy for an organization to call a dog daycare center and create a partnership and sponsor a portion of the daycare cost fees. It really doesn't cost that much in, in terms of retaining and keeping your employees super, super happy. I know for a fact, you know, I've interviewed thousands of people, um, you know, from a recruiter standpoint, but also as a HR professional, I've worked with a lot of different employees over the years. And when I interview people about what kind of benefits are you looking for, what would make a difference to you? It's not, listen, I want, I want lunch. I want pizza on Thursdays at the office. It's not stuff like that. Like, does that help? Yes. Is it great? Yes. Yeah, so I'm never going to, you know, knock any organization that's trying uh, to engage with their employees through moments like that. I think that's really amazing. But it's really the stuff that's really going to move the needle is being able to take, you know, 15, 20 percent off my dog daycare bill like that is going to be huge. And it's yeah. so easy for an employer to do that. So, um, I mean, that that that's the gold right there. And then to your point about like mixed family styles and, and you know, how it's there's it, it's a mixed bag, like everyone has a different yeah. way of life. You know, another another one of my favorites has been like adoption um, uh, benefits. You know, if someone's looking to adopt, there's yeah. adoption benefits or there's um, IVF treatment services that you can sponsor as an employer. Uh -huh. um, I know that uh, Red Bull um, has an amazing uh, package for families, um, you know, that are trying to get pregnant or trying to adopt. So, um, you know, you can even offer small things like, you know, uh, expanding your coverage for PTO. So when, um, you know, you have a, a, a employee who has adopted a child, um, extending your uh, PTO for them to get the same as like a maternity family would or a paternity family. Um, and so, you know, just having, again, just being creative, I think, you know, taking a good pulse, you know, there's a, a lot of survey ways that you can um, connect with your employer, employee audience and figure out what they're actually looking for. Um, there's so you, you mentioned earlier, like, what are other people doing around the world? Yeah. Um, you know, taking an audit of what other companies, what other countries are doing and bringing those cool ideas to the table, because luckily, as an employer, you have the ability to be creative and um, create a, a benefit plan that is really unique and special for your employees. And that is what will make the difference of whether someone stays or not. Yeah. I mean, I have to tell you the, the ad adoption assistance just floored me because I mean, it's very well known how challenging that process is and to have, you know, the, a support coming from, you know, a place where you spend a lot of your time, uh, that that's really astounding. Yeah, it's it's pretty special. So when I see anything like that, I note it. Um, you know, I've got a in my this is how much of a HR nerd I am. In my uh, in my notes on my personal phone, I just keep like a running list of cool benefits. When I encounter one, I write it down. And if it's not always possible, especially for smaller companies, to have like this amazing mixed bag of benefits. Um, on the surface. But when you look at how a lot of these things are free or low cost, um, you know, it really is possible for even small employers to have just such an amazing benefit offering for their employees. You know, even like uh, there's so many employees that will, um, sorry, employers um, that will sign up for services that are still employee funded. Like it's like a $99 program here or whatever for the year. But, um, you know, just having a, a partnership, you know, where you've called that company, you've created a relationship with them and you've asked them for a discount um, on behalf of the employees, even stuff like that, where it's truly low cost or no cost to the business. There's just no excuse at that point to not have some kind of additional benefit outside of like health insurance. Yeah. 
Wow, this has been a really cool and unique conversation. Thank you so much for all this insight and inspiration and excitement toward HR. Um, But before we wrap up, is there anything that you think I missed or would like to add? No, this has just been so delightful. I always love talking about human resources. And, you know, I'll just again, um, you know, champion that I'm always happy to help service members that are in the process of transition. Um, you know, so feel free, um, you know, to those that are, are listening to, to reach out anytime. I'm always happy to help. And I thank you so much, Lindsay, for the platform and the ability to have this conversation today. It's great. This has been awesome. Thank you again, Amy. And if you or anyone you know is like Amy who wants to create some um, low-hanging fruit opportunities and benefits for employees, email me, lindsay at staffgeek.com. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to Staff Geek's People Analytics Podcast. I'm your host, Lindsay Patton, and I'm always looking to interview leaders who put people first. If you or someone you know lead with a people-first mindset, please email me at lindsay at staffgeek.com. That's L-I-N-D-S-A-Y at staffgeek.com. If you want to take things a step deeper and understand your organization's true culture DNA, I encourage you to take Staff Geek's free culture assessment. Just head to staffgeek.com and click the button that says free culture assessment. Thanks again for listening.